Hey, welcome in, everybody. The next edition of the Sports Fanatic News Philadelphia Phillies offseason show. As I now have my great co host who is off his busy schedule for one day down there in Oklahoma, always doing something for their sports teams down there. Um, but, Andrew, how are you doing on this Sunday today as we are going to talk about our Phillies small moves only offseason thus far coming up pretty soon? Yeah, you know, it's a. Uh... I'm doing pretty good. It's a mixed sports weekend so far. You know, Oklahoma State had the big win over Oklahoma yesterday, and I was down in Stillwater for that. So if my voice is a little scratchy, it's from yelling down there. (laughs) Um, But then, of course, obviously, the Eagles' uh, tough loss today against the Giants. So uh, a mixed sports weekend, but obviously, again, that great win for Oklahoma State. So I was pretty happy yesterday. I was at, actually, since uh, you're know, uh, Nick Master, who went to our high school, signed with the Phantoms for a PTO. So I got to watch him live. yeah, at the Phantoms game yesterday, two rows behind the ice. So that was kind of cool. Plus, he hit somebody into the boards right in front of me. So that was <laughs> that, that that was really cool. But anyway, we're not here to talk about a hockey or Oklahoma State. In this one, we're here to talk about the Phillies offseason, which thus far, it's like if you look at the Mets offseason, they've done what we did in signing the small guys. The problem is they also signed like Antonio Santos and taking a chance on Nick Plummer, who was a top prospect at one time in the Cardinals organization hit well in the minors this year. So the Mets went, let's give him a shot as an extra outfielder. But then they did the other side of it, which we're waiting for the Phillies to do made decent, solid, small moves that you like in retrospect to maybe fit in the bottom of the roster. But they also made the top of the roster moves, getting Eduardo Escobar, um, getting, of course, Starling Marte is the biggest guy, and then getting Marcana, who's consistently been one of the better fielders in baseball, wherever you decide to put him at, and also is a pretty solid bat. So that adds to your defense uh, run differential there as well, which is always something pitchers like when you're trying to bring pitchers in and something the Phillies don't have to help bring pitchers in. Um, but what do you think this far of the Phillies? I don't mind getting the manuals of the world and the sheriffs of the world and the Nelsons and Sands of the world. The problem is I'm still waiting for the bigger things to come. That's how I feel about it. Like, I'm not going to knock those moves because like, I'm not going to say they suck because I don't think they suck just because we didn't make bigger moves. It's just, we made the smaller moves like the Mets. I highlighted too with Santos and Plummer. We just didn't do what the Mets did then and make the bigger moves yet, which I'm still waiting for and think we're going to do. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough situation. I mean, obviously you want to play – clearly the Phillies are playing the patient game, and it's tough as fans to wait for these these moves because you see all these moves already happening. We've already missed out on a handful of guys that would have helped our – made our team better in in spots that we've lacked for the last five to ten years, and and now you lose – one of your biggest holes in your bullpen, you lose your, your most reliable and best piece in that bullpen from the last five years, which is also frustrating. So, and now, now on top of that, you see your rival going out making moves left and right, and see them linked to every big free agent. It seems like. So, I don't know. I'm disappointed with the Phillies. I understand, like you said, you're waiting for the, a bigger move, but at this point, you already lost on one of the top center fielders in the market. You already lost out on one of the better shortstops in the market. You already lost out on some starting pitching, and now you lost out on a reliever. So, and these are all guys that could have helped this team better. Starling Marte, he's a guy that the Phillies should have been after from day one when the Marlins traded him to when they were traded last year. Then they went lose a guy on a guy um, uh, here today. You lose out on a couple of outfielders. Uh, Garcia, made the team better. Abasio Garcia went to the uh, Marlins. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Garcia goes to the Marlins inside your division. You have Cole Calhoun uh, go to the Rangers today. He would he would have been a better outfielder than what. Our, uh, he fits into the great defensive solid back category, just like Connor, yeah. but in a different aspect. Power RBI bat where Connor has a little bit more contact. Exactly. And I think what's made me frustrated more than anything is, you know, when we had Matt contact, you're kind of used to it. But you sign a guy like Dave Dombrowski and all you hear is, OK, now we're going to get back to the big time signings. We're going to go after guys. Dombrowski is aggressive here. He's aggressive there. Well, where is it? I mean, at this point, that's where I'm confused on. And now you have the Mets showing off their they're, uh, they're wild a little bit, so I'm ready for the Phillies to do it, and maybe it's here to come. I mean, I think we were talking about before we got on, you had Jeff Passon's uh, tweet. Uh, these next 24 hours before the uh, CBA deadline is going to be uh, pretty pretty crazy, he said. So buckle up and 
uh, let's get ready for it because hopefully this means the Philly is going to do something. His exact tweet was, quote, the madness is just beginning. This was after the um, Marcus Simeon deal with the Rangers. He said the madness is just beginning. This is going to be a well of the 24 hours, end quote. And then you saw about three other guys go within 10 minutes, I think, after he tweeted that. So I'm ready for it. Hopefully this means some moves with the Phillies are about to happen. And I know you're hoping just as much as I am because – I think we all want to get back to some Red October because we've sure missed that in the last 10 years. Yeah, well, I think also with Dombrowski, like when I went back at some, not really back at them, but just debated with somebody in the comments section, or I forget if it was Facebook or Twitter. I want to say Facebook. But um, you can only do as much as your top allows you to do, which we heard Dombrowski call out ownership for not giving them enough money to go out and get the biggest pieces. That could still be happening. We're not, uh, we're not upstairs. Well, we're not in the executive offices. So we don't know what's happening from that end of things. Is Middleton still holding the team back? Sorry to cut you off, but real quick, to go off that, I would agree if he didn't admit to that ending this offseason. He clearly made it in that same press conference. He said, well, yes, we were handicapped <clears throat> last year. That is not going to be the case this offseason. Oh, I agree. So, but did so he see that if he didn't want this backlash, he shouldn't have said that. And that's where I take issue with it is that he admitted to that stuff holding him back has been lifted. So if it's truly been lifted, where are the moves? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I just think, for me, like, did he admit to that without Middleton really 100% blessing the fact that he's like, okay, I'm definitely going to go over and beyond to maybe even go to the tax if we need it? Or did he just say that hoping – that he, because he has more weight than any other GM we had really in the whole 21st century, um, is he going to just, other than Gillick, is he just going to listen to him basically and go, okay, well, Dave said I need to give him more money. I am going to give him more money type thing. He shouldn't have said it. I agree with that aspect. But just because he said it, I'm not sure if that actually meant Middleton was committed to it or if that was Dombrowski just hoping that he would commit to it because somebody with his stature said it. That's more. And there's no way to actually know. But to me, he's been around the business long enough. So if he's going to come out and say that, uh, I'm going to take his word for it because I don't think he he lie about a situation and make things worse in terms of uh, fans questioning where, like, where are the moves at and how much is he handicapped. I don't think that would be something he would want. Um, if anything, he wanted people to know that he has that handicap. So that'd be a weird thing to lie about for how much he's been around. No, I don't think it would have been him lying about it. I think it would have been him simply being on the wrong page with Middleton, if that was the case. It would have been a misunderstanding or a, we've seen it happen in the past. Middleton promises something and doesn't uh, bank on the promise other than if it's Bryce Harper. Uh, so yeah. like, there's been that aspect of it, too. But as we move on. We'll shortly recap before we get into guys we still like on the market, <clears throat> Michael Conforto, um, that are available to be able to. He didn't get signed yet, I didn't see, so. Um, but that we're going to be able to get. But we did bring in some guys, potentially the best potential guy we brought in actually is not a pitcher, even though we do need pitching. But I do like Emmanuel, who we brought in, because he doesn't have the control issues. He's coming off of a weird PED. Well, he had the PED suspension uh, over a year ago, but it was one of those weird ones where they don't a lot of people don't think he actually used peds it was kind of like the chooch one where it's like you use certain medical things and then it's in the ped book of the mlb quote unquote type thing uh coming off of major injuries he's had but he has control he's the only guy we picked up that actually has control so if the new development team this is going to show if the new development team is good at developing pitching compared to the old one because if he doesn't have control all of a sudden then the Phillies just suck at developing pitching <laughs> because because yeah. he actually doesn't have the control problems like Sheriff Alvarado, also Nick Nelson, and even Scott Moss, who was once a very good prospect um, coming and bringing him over, who was in the one Valor trade. He doesn't have to harness the control. He just has to keep locating his pitches and doing his thing. But I like the pitching me- pickups we made. It's just the other three have to harness the control. Most, I think he might try to still make a fifth starter because he was more of a starter. And then you see what you can do there when he harnesses control. But um, first, I'll let you go to the pitchers. What do you think of the small pitching pickups? Because we see around Major League Baseball with how stagnant relief pitching is and how roller coastery it is. Usually some of the best teams in the league have at least two or three random guys coming into the season you don't count on. And then they actually play well, like the A's, Rays, Dodgers, Giants. Zach Littell is one to throw in there. 
they all have guys you pick up from the waiver wire and they uh, make a big impact for you. The Phillies, it's just we're not used to that happening for us. But with the new development staff, maybe it's more likely to happen. Who knows? Uh, I agree to an extent. I mean, this is stuff we I feel like we've kind of done in the past. We signed these small market, not big name guys, and it's backfired on us. Now the question is, have we gotten the right guys? It's not anything that gets me excited. It's not anything that drives me forward. I think it still leaves a ton of holes. You're, you're taking on guys that might make the team. They might not make the team. We've seen it in the past. So to me, it's it's just a, a blah kind of move. Like, who who really well, cares? I feel I mean, like for us at times, it's it might, have we got the right guys and do we have the right staff to develop them once we bring them in? Because if you look at other guys that go on elsewhere, Irving got developed into a fist starter for this season at least with the A's. Pavetta got developed into a fourth or fifth caliber, at least, with the Reds. So, like, guys, when they go elsewhere, their staff does better with them than ours. So, I but feel like point. now, that, yeah, now you brought here. in – Oh, well, well, in the major leagues, but you brought in Preston Manningly. If some of these guys start in the minors, you brought in – you got rid of a lot of development people and have been bringing in new guys through the course of the offseason. Will that make a difference going through the system, changing the systematical way of how you go about things? It's not going to be with the snap of a finger, but – that's why I'm hoping with these guys we brought in, it'll change us to being more like the teams like the Dodgers, the, as much as I admit it, the Astros, the Rays, the A's, even the Yankees, how they can pick up some guys that are not big names, but then coach them well to either make them go back to being a very solid player like they once were when drafted or being that underdog that eventually does find a way to be have at least one or two successful seasons. And maybe it does, um, but until we get proven that things are changed and these guys are actually going to make a difference, it's going to be hard to get excited about it. I mean, we have to see the results take place. So, yes, we have made a couple of changes here and there, but until I see those changes work, I mean, like I already mentioned, we saw a big change in the GM front office and bringing in Dave, and so far nothing has changed these last two years under him. So, again, until – I see that change happen. It's going to be tough to believe. Do I want it to happen? Without question, obviously. I'm more excited to, to get some good talent in here than anyone else in the city is. And I think that's something we're going to have to get done. And, yeah, these guys could be something. Like, we got the, the lefty from the Guardians, Scott Moss. We'll see what he's able to do. But, like, again, these are going to be minor league guys that are going to have a chance to make your, your uh, lineup. Yeah, uh, Another another lefty, Kent Emanuel. Uh, we'll see what he does from the Astros. Um so who knows? It's going to be an interesting development for those guys, and we'll see what happens. And um, we got the catcher from the Astros as well, Garrett Stubbs. Uh, you can also Astros, play the outfield. So yeah, one of my Astros, Astros friends. Astros. I have an Astros friend being, like from living in Oklahoma, and he's he he kind of liked that guy. So he said uh, he's someone that could turn into something. So maybe we'll see what happens. But again, to your point, it all depends on how well can we develop these guys. And so far. Look at what we've done. We failed to develop uh, Scott Kingery. We'll see what Alec Boehm does this year, but he had a fail of a year last year. Um, Dominic Brown, we, we blew up and failed. I mean, name me a guy who we succeeded with, and that that's where my skepti- skepticism comes in. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree with that. I just know I have to believe it till I see it. When I commented to somebody, I said the same thing, but I'm not going to count out these guys until – I see what happens. I'm not going to have a pre-reserved judgment because of our old development team when now we have a new one. I still have to believe it till I see it, but I'm not going to reserve the same judgment I had for them because that's not fair to the new staff until I I see it. Um, But when it comes to the best guy I honestly think we got out of this, it might be the other catcher, which was um, Donnie Sands from the Yankees thing, because I was going back and forth with somebody that was a hardcore Yankees fan. And they were talking about how he's just progressed steadily at the minor league level as a switch hitting catcher, which is also sexy to have to begin with, having another switch hitter to mix into your lineup. That one can actually hit. Sorry, Sean, but Andrew Knapp can't hit. Um, So um, that was to somebody we used to do a podcast with. Sean knew when we did any, always next year. But Donnie Sands at the minor league level, if you look at his minors career, he is a career uh, 268 hitter. And he has 183 RBIs and 26 home runs in 368 games. So that's pretty solid and pretty good. And he's been at the AAA level. Everything I've honestly been reading around on top of Stubbs, because Stubbs is kind of your depth guy that you could carry three catchers with Stubbs on your roster if you want to, because you can play the outfield. And also I read he worked on 
the infield last offseason, too, so you might be able to give him some time in infield spots, especially on, like, the right side, first or second. That's what they said he worked on. So Sands might be the lead candidate in the Phillies' minds just by how he was developing in the Angels organization, being a switch hitter, being a guy that can hit and also field, not to the level of guys like Marcon, but field pretty well, because I still think Marcon's a guy, that's why we brought in more catching, He's eventually going to be moved in one of these future moves because he has the most value as Ohapis has good value developing himself, but Marcon has the most now value. And I think that's why we brought in more guys. And Sands, I think, is honestly going to be the lead candidate that it's like, you know, this is your backup job to to lose, basically, coming into the preseason being we did designate. Obviously, we got rid of Andrew Knapp, too, so he's not even in the picture. Yeah, no, I I agree. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. You're gonna need that backup. Obviously, JT can't play every game. We'll can't see what <laughs> we'll see what uh, happens with the CBA or yeah, the uh, agreement coming up here. Whether they're gonna win the DH for the entire league, if not. So uh, it's I think with some answers here in the next few days, next few weeks. Um, here is the MLB tries to get their contract situated, but no, yeah, these are interesting moves. We'll see what happens, but still plenty of names there out there on the actual free agency that could actually make a difference for this team. Uh, here coming up. Yeah, and then you said, um, who did Cole Calhoun go to? Because that didn't register yet on the website. I didn't see. That's the only one that you brought up that I did not see who he went to. He's uh, he's he's going to the Texas Rangers, making their second big the, move of the, the day. Rangers, okay. After uh, getting Marcus Semien uh, earlier today on a seven-year deal, which man, that's a high-paying deal for. Correct if I'm wrong, but I think he's like 31, 32 years old. So for a shortstop, seven years, it's gonna be. He's going to be winding down about 37, 38 there. Winning the Worlds. I think they're banking on the way Toronto's ascending with a great prospect pool, and a lot of the young guys already have them winning in the next three to four, and then you're not going to care. the back. Like, if you win in the next three to four, yeah. nobody's going to care about the back. It's one of those types of deals, basically. He's a late bloomer, was a terrible fielder early in his career, worked his butt off to become a very good one all of a sudden, and then really high yeah. value. So that's one of those let's hope we win in the first – three, four, maybe five seasons. And then if that doesn't happen, yeah, people are definitely going to be talking about, I agree, did that kind of log jam their team from being able to win if they don't find a way to build the roster around them. But the Jays already have made other good, or not the Jays, the Rangers have already made other good moves. Um, So if they can continue to do that, they should be okay. Yeah, he is 31, so he'll be 38. And just to touch on that, some some other rumors that have popped up here since we've been on um, in these last 10 minutes. Uh, Rangers, even though they've signed Marcus Semien, they're a very strong push currently trying to get Trevor Story still, and they're believed to move Semien to, to second, and then second they'll start Story at short. short. Yeah, okay. Uh, so apparently they're still one of the front runners for Story, uh, even after those two signings today. Uh, another name that they're saying should fall into place here in the next 24 hours before the uh, lockout, if it happens, is uh, Nick uh, Castellanos. Uh, they, they said teams to look out for are the Phillies, Giants, Astros are some of the strongest teams to show interest. And then this is an interesting note um, before I let you kind of touch on some of these. Max Scherzer, Kevin Gosman, Javier Baez, Trevor Story should be the next group of free agents, uh, including Nick uh, Castellanos, to fall before the uh, – the MLB deadline here uh, within the next day or two. And then Robbie Ray, Chris Bryant, Corey Seager, Carlos Correa are more likely to be uh, after agreement deals there, um, possibilities. So kind of an interesting note there. And I already yeah, told you what Jeff Passon said. So we'll see what happens here in the next 24 hours, but maybe touch on some of those names here. Yeah, and then it also looks like as a good still late of his career, bottom end of the rotation starter, Corey Kluber um, ended up going to the Rays as well, um, which for the Rays is a good veteran to mix in. They had Rich Hill last year before they moved him. Now they have Corey Kluber as a good veteran to mix in. So that's a kind of a Rays level move there and a, a good move that they made with the the paying <laughs> – where paying um, Franco was not a Rays – Typical raise move, but he did earn top prospect, did his thing. We'll see if he earns the contract as time goes on, but he at least earned the respect to get offered and break the tide of the, what the raise usually do. Um, but no, I think when it comes to Scherzer, uh, obviously everybody is going to have. Man, Max has been consistent. He's going to the Hall of Fame. When Gosman really has emerged the last couple seasons, and particularly out of big time, looking like he could be a two last season. So that's why you have the interest in him where Max, if I'm getting any pitcher, I don't see the Phillies getting shirts, but I'm just talking about any team around. 
I would prioritize even with his age just because if you manage him well, the Dodgers basically just went full force of surge and you saw him tire out in the playoffs. If you have a full-blown rotation that's like four deep, three deep, you're not going to have to do that. Well, the Dodgers had some injuries that caused them to have to kind of push their older great starter and Scherzer a little bit more. But if he goes to the right team, I think he's going to be still good for a couple years. I would say with Scherzer, though, you want to do like a two year deal at this point of his career. So you're not taxing yourself if you do four years and then it eventually does fully catch up to him. But Gosman kind of fits into the was once regarded um, earlier in his career as a bigger name guy and then never really found it, whether it was with Baltimore or wherever, and then comes to the Giants and that rotation, that staff, uh, they figure him out. Obviously, I think if they could keep him, they probably will because they apparently they're still in on him, even though they signed everybody under the sun, and it seems like they're in on any other veteran pitcher out there. Um, but they are still in on him themselves. I would say he would be the guy that if I'm the Phillies because he's ascending, if you want to add another guy to your rotation, I would go for – that because he's younger and if you give him three or four years he kind of fits into the tier below wheeler but like the ascending later in their careers looking like their best stuff is ahead of them category he's not going to be like wheeler because he's not that level of guy he's a tier below him but he fits into that same scheme of just being a guy that ascended late and seems like he has his best ahead of him and hasn't thrown as many innings as guys like max scherzer yeah, I think the big the big name I'm hearing for uh, Gosman, it sounds like he might go back to the Giants, which would make a lot exactly, of sense. Exactly, yeah. Um, trying to get back to where they were winning 100-plus games. I don't know. Scherzer's kind of a curveball for me. Uh, I agree. I completely agree with you on the two, maybe three-year deal just to see where his arm's at. But um, I don't know where he's going to uh, land. I, I think it could be a handful of destinations. Obviously, when the trade deadline was happening last year, he was all about talking about he wanted to go on the West Coast, West Coast, West Coast. So he hasn't really said much about free agency. So I don't know if that's still his desire is staying out on the West Coast, maybe like an, staying in L.A., going back to the Dodgers. But that would kind of surprise me, honestly, if he goes back to the Dodgers. But look out for the Angels. There he signed Noah Syndergaard for the back end or, or kind of see where his health is at. Maybe they get Serger to lock up a, a spot there in the front end of that rotation. Maybe can the Giants go after him? Maybe they say, okay, Kevin Gosman costs this. Why don't we pay a few extra bucks go get Scherzer? I could see that kind of happening. Um, and then, again, I think he's going to want to stay on the West Coast because of the way he acted at the deadline last year. But apparently the Mets are heavy suitors. So we'll see what, what the Mets have the offer. Obviously, both being Phillies fans, we sure hope that doesn't happen. Um, I, I know we didn't complain when he got traded away from Washington and out of our division. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I mean, it's all going to depend. It's just the Giants, obviously, they kept them. Um... Alex Wood in town there, and they also kept uh, Anthony DiSclefani, who um, did very well for them last year and emerged himself. So it seems like they're trying to keep their thing together, so I wouldn't be surprised if Gosman stays there. And see, that's why, listen, I like Gosman, and I would love for the Phillies to kind of add him in the rotation, but my thing is, if you're the Giants, Alex Wood and Anthony DiSclefani, they kind of already match Gosman, so why why sign that another, like, why not go that extra tier you just won the 100 games. Go and prove it. Like, uh, listen, again, I like Kevin, and it'll help a lot of teams. But if you're the Giants, you just won 107 games. You already re-signed two guys like Kevin. Go get that top-tier guy. Really solidify <laughs> that uh, starting rotation. And, um, oh, man, why am I blanking on his name? But the young guy who really oh, took Webb. that step. Uh, Webb. So, yeah, Webb. Webb. Now you can have the rotation of Serge, Serger, Webb, um, Wood, and Scavani. This, this like, why not go with that? Like, instead of adding another kind of top or second tier to third tier type pitcher there and go get that top tier guy, get a veteran, lead that rotation, lead that team mixed with a lot of other veterans in a Brandon Crawford, Brandon Belt, et cetera, and really kick off there for, for the star next year and hopefully win that uh, World Series for them. And you got the reigning uh, manager of the year, so obviously got the right coaching staff in place. You'd have the right pitching staff in place. And their bullpen was pretty good. So go run with that. Go improve rather than just stand pat. Yeah, no, that makes sense because Scherzer's definitely – Gosman's a guy that looks like he's ascending at this age. But like I said, a tier below wheel. If you bring him, he's probably going to be a very good three. 
Scherzer is a guy that just brings you over the top. So yeah, if you if you already made the moves the Giants made, it makes more sense at this point to go. Let's do the bring us over the top move because it seems like the staff with the young Andrew Bailey manning the pitching cap or doing the overall stuff, they've hired a very good staff that I can't remember everybody's names now. I talked about it in the video I did about Kaplan winning the manager of the year. If people want to go back and check that out, I went over their, most of their coaching staff. Um, but they did a very good job at getting it done. They talked about it on – I mean, when you have Hot Stove and MLB Network signaling out time at times to talk about staffs and different podcasts I listen to, that's when you know the damn staff's doing their job. <laughs> so yeah. you don't normally take time on podcasts and different things to talk about the damn staff. You normally talk about what's going on on the field. So that's when you know they're doing their job. Um, but when it comes to guys still available, obviously we need bullpen help. But in terms of in order to help pitchers want to come here – you need to solidify your defense more, too, because that's what the Mets did in getting the Connors of the world. Obviously, Eduardo's been a solid defender his entire career, and Starlin Marte's been a wizard his entire career. Um, so, like, you got you added to your defense as well as your offense there. Um, when it comes to the Phillies, I think this is a move anticipating the DH, Nick Castellanos, because uh, if you get Nick Castellanos, I love Nick Castellanos and the way he can hit. He's basically the current jd like when jd wasn't the same then he kind of went obviously got himself going and he went to boston was like the great like overall hitter never was the most snazzy fielder anywhere but could get it done if he had to for a period of time that's pretty much Cassianos. he's one of the best bats in the game but you know is not going to be the best fielder unless if you just mix him in there i think that's a move anticipating the dh and i like the move if there's going to be a dh I 100% will want Castellanos on a team. Even if there isn't, I would still want him for his bat. It's just it's going to be that Pat Burrow left field effect a little bit where he can move quicker than Pat Burrow, but he's going to miss some balls just like Pat Burrow where you're like, oh, son of a... <laughs> so like, you got to get used to that a bit while Buddy's going to make up for it at the plate a lot of times, even more so than Pat Burrow did because Pat Burrow was a very good player but not one of the best hitters in all of baseball, yeah. where Nick Castellanos is one of the best hitters in all of baseball. So I'm fine with that move, but in order to also help that out, I think a guy, the Phillies, because he's kind of the better version of Cole Calhoun, is Michael Conforto if you're able to get him, even though you do have to pay. I understand at that point we do have to pay a draft pick to our rival. Yes, I understand that. But we're trying to build up our – defense here as well as offense to try to convince some of the pitchers still in the market to go, oh, I want to play for the Phillies because they're not going to let me down, even if I do well on the mound, which that's been the case with us in the last couple of years, too. A guy can do well on the mound and his numbers look worse because we let him down fielding-wise. So if you bring in a guy like Castellanos, I think a good guy to counterbalance it, if there isn't going to be a DH especially, but even if there is, would be Conforto because he's been one of the better fielding outfielders in the career. He has a great arm. And he also has the power to RBI potential and also had a down year last year. Normally, like his career average is 255. 232 is not typically what he's going to hit. So I think he'll bounce back. He profiles well to Citizens Bank Park um, to be a type of guy that once the heat gets going there, he's just going to start hitting them up in the air and get them flying. I like Michael Conforto a lot as a pickup for the Phillies to steal from more division rival there so they can't get him back on top of everybody else they added to their team. Yeah, I fully agree. Anytime you can steal somebody from your division, I think that goes a long way. I think we all know that. We all hope. Uh, Conforto, yeah, I, I, it's funny. I've never been the biggest Conforto fan. Maybe it's because he's been on the Mets. Um, I don't Probably. know what it <laughs> what is. That? Probably. Yeah, we don't really tend to like Mets players unless if we have a reason to point out why we like attributes of them for later on in their careers for us to get them. But <laughs> I, I just think he's another – kind of average hitter um and i had that one year i know in 2020 he had the 322 average and had a phenomenal year in, in the shortened season but if you throw that away you're looking at kind of a mediocre hitter a 232 average a 257 average 243 average um it has some power last year only hit 14 home runs 55 rbis uh he had a 33 home run year so to me he's just another non-consistent bat and that's not what this team needs i feel like we have enough of these non-consistent um, hitters in our lineup, and if we can bring something in, and I think, I think that's kind of, I think that's why if it comes down to, I think you're looking at hit like to me, him and Castellanos are about in a way a similar player, but in terms of the defensive side of things, but Castellanos is going to offer a lot more at the plate. 
Um, been a little more consistent than uh, Mike has been throughout his career. Um, he, he's kind of had the more recent success, the 34 home runs last year, 100-plus RBIs with the Reds team, but batted over 300. You throw him in the mix there with JT Brace. I'm excited to see that. Um, so th- this is this is the guy I want playing uh, in left field, I think, would be Nick. Um, uh, Nick Castellanos here for us. If we can get him, um, then obviously if they add the defense Well, my as well. point was if there's a DH. I feel like if there's a D- The other thing with Conforto is, yeah, you're right. If you take out that one season, he's more 243, 250. But if you get um, 28 and 82 RBIs or 33 and 92 RBIs, I don't really care about your batting average. Your batting average is a stat that people don't look no, at as close. I get that. And then your fielding is also, I think Conforto is a tier, at least a tier above Nick Castellanos. Because Castellanos is not a good fielder. I would consider Conforto a good fielder because he makes – because of his speed, sometimes he won't get the balls you would expect Marte to get to, but that's because he wasn't gifted with that God-given speed that Starlin Marte was gifted with. But he makes pretty good jumps in the corners. He has a good arm. I remember whenever you would hear people in baseball were talking about him, they would talk about Conforto as a good fielder with RBI potential, not where Castellanos was fantastic bat, will the fielding come? So I, I want him more for the left field fielding aspect. And then if you can add both, you kind of kill two birds in one stone because you got Castellanos. They have the DH. You got Castellanos to be the pivotal bat you were talking about. And then, like I'm talking about, to be a good fielder that's also a very good mix-in bat that's good in left field. I think he's going to feel better in left field, too, than right. Then you would also um, have that there to be able to match with it. It's kind of like I would get both of them if you could because if the DH is coming, you can afford. This is what we were talking about earlier in the video. You got to start spending if you want to compete with the teams in your division and the other teams around, if you have the DH, you can afford to get Conforto for say three years and then Castellanos give him whatever big ass contract he wants. So here's the thing the Phillies need to figure out now is you had the opportunity two top tier uh, center field slash leadoff hitters on the market and you failed to go after both of them uh, and Stalin Marte and Brian Buxton who, who signed a deal today with the, the to go the back twins, to the, with the twins. So, None of these two guys help you in that sense. So I don't want to spend two, spend that much money on two of the same positions. If you go out and get one of them, great. But I'd rather you get one of them, fill the need at center field and the leadoff hitter. Because that has been this team's biggest problem for the last three years is we don't have anybody to lead off. Gene Segura, fantastic second hitter. Harper, three. Hoskins, four. Like, and then honestly, if, if you get that solidified, solid leadoff hitter, then you're looking at Segura batting second. Harper batting third, Hoskins fourth, Castellanos, Kyle Schwarber, or Michael Conforto at five, and then JT at six. That's phenomenal. The problem is you're still missing that leadoff hitter, and until you get that leadoff hitter, your offense is going to have the same problem that we've been having over and over again these last few years. So I don't know. I guess that's maybe a question I turn to you before I answer, but who do you turn to now to to try to find that spot, the leadoff spot? Because you still are missing that, and you've already seen names fly off the board here early on in free agency that now you can't get. Who are you looking to now? I guess you have to make a trade now for that spot, right? I feel like the thing I was going back to earlier, which is why, touching on one thing you said, I feel like if you get Castellanos and Schwarber, you're getting guys for the same exact position because Kyle Schwarber, can. if you look at his fielding numbers when it's hitting his radius, can field, he's just slow. He's not quick. But Conforto, actually, if they have the DH, I don't think Nick Castellanos is playing the field very much at all. If they put no, the I DH agree, in, but right now, right now we don't Conforto have the DH, so I'm talking well, without the DH. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, because I was going to say, with the DH, I don't think it would be for the same position. I don't think Castellanos would really see the field except to rest people. Um, but, yeah, yeah, if there's no DH, then, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, but... For me, there, there's not really much you would get for the um, leader position. There's like the guys that have done it a little bit in their careers, like the Kevin Pillars of the world in the free agency and all those guys that I've talked about in the past that are more fielding-esque than they are let-me-set-the-table-esque. So like those are just filler pieces, too. They're not a guy that are going to be your leadoff hitter for the longevity. So I feel like the Markan piece getting in these other catchers and Sands and Stubbs Maybe the guy they were looking to, since we have interest in Castellanos, we heard about the Phillies being in, even though there's some reports he's not going to be traded from the Pirates, but being one of the main teams in on the Reynolds sweepstakes. Um, So are they going to trade for that center field position? I feel like that might be the most amped position they're actually looking to going 
this isn't the market. We don't have the guys. We don't want to pay for Marte, and we don't have the other guys who want to fill it. You're not going to fill it with a guy like Pilar, per se, even though he's been steady in his career, like a steady Eddie guy. He's not going to plug that spot for a while, even if he has a good season like he did with the Giants. It's just going to be one season. So you might as well go out and get somebody that's able to fill it for a while, whether that is Brian Reynolds, if they actually do trade him, or somebody else around the baseball sphere that can kind of come in and be a more consistent because d- signing guys like Brian Goodwin who's and Gerardo like guys like that um they're not they're just going to be filler pieces so you need to try to find a way to get another guy there I agree with that the leadoff position the only guy on our team that was actually a solid leadoff hitter when I thought he played it and managed the leadoff position well was a rookie and that was that was when we put Veerling at the leadoff position a couple times. And I don't want Matt Veerling. No offense to Matt Veerling, but I don't want Matt Veerling having to be our consistent leadoff hitter for an 162 game season. Being this guy just worked his butt off to actually come from being a doubted prospect at one time to getting to the majors. Usually, you don't all of a sudden go. You had a good first season. We're throwing the world at you. Like that's typically not how that worked. So I don't want that to happen. But you can use him in a bigger capacity and mix him into the leadoff spot. But I think a trade's coming for center field because that's the best way to solve it. Otherwise, you're just having filler pieces solving it because you're just getting a platoon guy for Veerling. Because Veerling can field center really well and hit well enough, as we saw when he was up. But is he ready to play a full season as a starter yet? No. That I would have big questions about. Yeah, Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's it's... Listen, I, I don't know where they're going to go. I would love Reynolds. I don't think the Pirates move on from him yet. Maybe at the deadline you could see that type of trade. I'd be surprised if he's moved before opening day. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we've kind of dug ourselves a, another hole here. And I don't know. I don't know. I think Bryson Stott's going to be up at some point. I don't think he's the Agreed. leadoff type type hitter. Um, so I don't think that's going to answer. I don't think that's going to answer anything. So I really don't see any in-house upcoming options unless, I don't know if you can think of anybody in the minors. But, again, I don't think anyone's in that sense. And then there's a couple guys that are minor league leadoff hitters, but do I think that translate to major league leadoff hitters? Like Simon Muziotti could be a minor league. I don't think so. Like, like it's like they're more of a probably eight, seven, eight hole hitters if they make it to the majors. So that's. That's the thing. You have guys that people will say maybe because they profile as minor league leadoff hitters, but I don't know if it'll translate to the next. Level. Like even Nick Maton can lead off in the minor leagues. You're not going to consistently lead off Nick Maton on your major league club. So, yeah, like that's an example right there. But also, here's a question I also had for you. Just because he filled the role of – um hitting the home runs and doing what he had to do well and actually did bounce back and have a solid fielding season. If we do bring in Castellanos, fix our center field, whether it's trade or whatever, would you go back to a one-year deal just to throw cuts back in left field? Because you have a familiarity with the team. He's a great locker room guy, and he still hit them in minor home runs and had RBIs. He just didn't have the average anymore, which makes sense. He's 35, and aging but he did kind of he still figured out a way like Shane said at the beginning of the season to adjust to the way his age has affected him and still have a half decent season with the home run and RBI production no absolutely I I bring back McCutcheon um I think a lot of people didn't like his average but I think at this point you're not looking for him as average and that's my point about the consistent hitters he's one of those guys you already have he's he's gonna draw walks he's gonna he's gonna have he's like you mentioned his home runs he still has the power he is fielding saw some some holes, but if you have a solid center fielder, solid right fielder, you saw progression in Segura's defense last year. Uh, I mean, I think you're okay with that in left field. I, don't, I think if you look at most outfield spots, left field is usually not one of your strongest. So I think you can survive without that. I'm okay with bringing a clutch back on a one year deal. I'm not going to lock him up to another three, four year deal like we did oh, no, uh, this definitely. past year. But if you if you have a chance, bring him back on one year. You're going to get that 25 to 30 home runs again from McCutcheon. Absolutely bring that back in. Um, a great clubhouse leader, great veteran to bring back. I think that's – I think if you were to bring McCutcheon back, you kind of have to pick pick your poison here with him and Didi. I know Didi's obviously another fun veteran there. I, I think they kind of play similar similar roles at this point in their career, kind of that next point. year, next age up. But you're going to have that – and I think at this point, based off last year, I take McCutcheon over Didi. So – 
to me, if you're going to have to pick and choose one of them, I would take McCutcheon over him. You move on from Didi. Maybe you can trade him or cut him or something for a reliever, bring in, open that money spot, and then go get a, a Corey Seager or Trevor Story, something like that. That's a possibility. Obviously, that's wishful thinking. Um, but who knows? I think that's something we're going to have to figure out. But to answer your question, after running my mouth a little bit there, mm-hmm. yes, I think uh, – I'm open. Or I'm definitely open to it. I think fans should be more open to it than I've, what I've read on social media and such on articles because um, I, I do think there's still room for him to play. And again, I don't think he's your leadoff hitter like we used no. him two years ago. But if you're going to tell me you can throw McCutcheon in the seven hole and he's going to hit, he's going to have an opportunity to hit uh, like 27 home runs like he did home. last year, have 80 plus RBIs in the seven spot. Because again, this is this is assuming you can go out and get. Uh, that leadoff hitter, and then you get the score two, Harper three, Hoskins four, and then that that five spot there, which at this point, if it's, you're going to bring in a, a story or C or something like that, yeah, that would definitely well, be. Well, I think you pick McCutcheon or it all depends on the DH, but I think yeah, you're picking McCutcheon over Castellanos there, so then you're going to move. I'm saying if there the, is a DH, if there wasn't, yeah. yeah. So you're going to move Kutch down. I'm going to say no DH. You're going to move Kutch down the seven and put that shortstop maybe in the five spot in, in the Trevor Story or Corey Seager, something like that. And, again, that, that, that's going to be an offense that goes a long, long way. And I think who would that leave? Oh, and then that leaves, I guess, Alec Bohm at eight. I mean, if you're telling yeah. me Alec Bohm's going to be hitting eight, I know he's down, had some down spots last year, but still pretty that's good eight. also no pressure. If you're coming yeah. back from a down year, you have no pressure if you're in that lineup. Exactly. Hitting eighth. Um but when it comes to center field, as much as I hate to admit it by looking at it, out of the people left in the free agency, Ian Desmond's 36 and didn't even really hasn't really played much. Uh, yeah. Ogubel Herrera, nope. Kevin Pillar, Jacoby Jones is kind of one of those hitters that everybody has always said has the pop if he can make contact with a good fielder. Maybe you can be the team to put it all together for him, but it's like we talked about with other guys, we have to wait and see if our new staff – development staff's able to be guys that can help out with that more in spring training. But, and then Jake Marisnik is a guy that's let off before in his career for the Astros and other teams, but he's more of just a fielder. He's not a great hitter. He's more of a fielder guy, but he's a guy you could bring in from the fielding perspective, I guess, on a one-year deal, or you could do that for Kevin Pillar. Those are the only free agents. Out of the free agents, the only guys I'm bringing in on one-year deals are Kevin Pillar, Jacoby Jones, and or where'd he go? Um... Kevin Pillar, Jacoby Jones, and or Jake Marisnik, and maybe, um, maybe just to have him in the minors, it, and not even for a major league deal, but a minor league deal, just to have him if you have too much injuries for his fielding, Billy Hamilton. But that's not even going to be to have him, expect him to play in the majors, where the other guys I would expect them to at least make the roster and play some center field. So. Yeah, the center fielders left aren't anything but any big names. They're 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 names that are gonna fill that uh, defensive spot, the defensive void. I think you sign one of them, then you're definitely okay with getting one of those guys in left field. Uh, I think the guys left are gonna be a defensive replacement or or a defensive starter that's hitting eighth. Uh, I don't see them really hitting anywhere <laughs> above that eighth spot. So again, not many good names there at left in center field. Again, you lost the big name in Southern Marta. Here's here's the sleeper one though that everyone forgets, including myself now until right now that he can play center field, and that's if you go out and sign Chris Bryant. That's Let's not forget, Chris Bryant's a free agent who can play five different positions. He's obviously going to be mainly listed at third base, but he's played enough center field where uh, in a lineup like the Phillies, you could see him playing in center field, and that could change things. So I think that's we'll, – we'll, we'll see where he goes. I'm interested to see what where he lands. But um, I'll tell you what, if – if the Phillies can't land story and he goes to the Rangers or something like that, I think the Phillies turn their attention to Chris Bryant. Whether they get him, that's another question. That's but I think right now, if based off what I've read and stuff, if I have to if my top three right now in terms of what I think the Phillies are looking at, I think Story's number one for him. Chris Bryant's number two for him. Uh so I I'm interested to see where it goes. Who's three? Um, what was that? It's three, Nick. Um yeah, I think so, I guess. Uh, I think in terms of offense, yeah, I, I would like to see some more rumors pick up for us for pitching-wise. I, I haven't really seen much um, in that sense. That's I don't know where – I still don't know where we're going to go. You already missed out on guys like Hector Neris, Aaron Loop. Um, uh, Graveman. Gar- Garcia signed, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe he did, yeah. And so did Kendall Graveman, who – 
was kind of my guy I was looking to because he's emerged out of the starter role as a reliever. If we weren't going to keep Hector, he'd probably be a couple million cheaper, which is exactly yeah. what ended up being the case. He's $2.5 million cheaper, yet the Phillies still went, nah, we don't need that. Nah, we don't need that. No, nah, that's all right. <laughs> like, so now I guess out of market names. Um, oh, no, my, my third I put over Castellanos actually would be uh, – Michael Givens, um, the reliever. Oh, the reliever. I've, I've actually heard a lot, yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. about the Phillies being invested in him. So I, I'm interested to see what happens there with him. I think, uh, listen, Phillies already missed out some names. You got some, you have veteran names now left. You you really don't know what you're getting out of these guys. I'm about to name now. Kenley Jansen, obviously a fantastic career lifetime closer. He's going to be 35 at the start of next year. You don't really know what you're going to get. You're, you're going to get some good innings, obviously, but. Is it going to be there for the whole year? Trevor, Trevor Rosenthal, good as of late, kind of shaky in the beginning of his career. What Rosenthal would you get? Brad Hand, he's been kind of down the last few years. Uh, uh, Iglesias, uh, bounced around with the Reds and the Angels. Kind of up and down. You really don't know what you're going to have. You're going to get high velocity. He was solid but, last year, but I don't want yeah. him as my club. Like, like the thing with uh, Rosell and Iglesias is, on the Angels, he worked, but that's not the biggest market. If he comes back to like a team like the Phillies, where the media is getting on him all the time, I don't think he'll do well. Just like Hector didn't do well in the closer role. Like he did all right at times, but we found him his best when he wasn't in the closer role, just doing his thing and not getting beat down, or when he was hot and not getting beat down by the media. Yeah. Where I feel like Inglacius kind of falls into the category of if you get him, don't close him. Like you can get him, but make him the eighth inning guy. But I don't yeah. think the Phillies would do that. Where that's why I don't know if I really want to go after Iglesias. Do we have a go-to lefty right now? Probably Jose. Oh, yeah. They're bringing him back, I guess. Well, he's still under, I don't think, I think you have arbitration years or something. Like, he's still our property. Yeah, like, he's not even a free agent. Okay. I was going to say, again, you only know what you get from time to time, but Jake Deakman's out there if you want to bring him back. Uh, three, eight, six year RA last year, three and three on the year. I would- um, so he, he's a lefty on the market. Well, he's an anchor it. lefty too, kind of how like ever since, even in his inconsistent seasons, like how Hector has done in his career, he's a guy you always know is going to have that bounce back and just take the damn ball. He's never going to like have the Pat Neshek effect of, ah, oh, well, you know, I can't pitch today after I haven't pitched for six straight days. And you're like, well, um, so like, he's one of those guys that you just consider like a dog out there in the mound that's going to just grind and take it throughout the year and pitch the like 55 60 65 so i like getting bringing in guys like that whenever you can so i definitely agree with deeks as a potential comeback piece to be the bigger lefty and the veteran guy that's more proven throughout his career in the bullpen still has some control issues but harnessed it more to be better than like what we've seen of alvarado which was just meh in his first season yeah no no question um again a lot of good names out there hopefully the next 24 hours, we, we'll have something, and maybe we can do, like, an emergency pod kind of thing uh, once one of these guys are signed. But um, I, I think my my top of the board left, at least, uh, I told you why I talked from the Phillies standpoint. I think my I think I lean Chris Bryant over Trevor Story, to be honest. I mean, obviously, I'd be okay with either one. I think my number one would be Chris Bryant for the sole purpose of – he can fill different holes for this team. You're going to have. That's what I was going to ask. Was it versatility that led you to Chris Bryant? Yeah. Yeah, because my thing is, I think Bryson Stott will be ready. I don't know about opening day, but I think he'll be ready pretty quick in the next year. So I kind of don't want to lock him up. I get you can move him to second, but Segura had a phenomenal year. Chris Bryant can fill the void of center field. He can fill the void of Alec Bohm struggling. Let's take give Alec Bohm a day off. Hoskins obviously coming off a big injury. You can move him to first. You can move Bohm to first, play Bryant at third. He just allows you to do a lot more with this team. So I'd rather see you go trade for maybe a, a mid-tier center fielder who can bat lead off, stick to him as lead off and a kind of a defensive option there, and then you can kind of fill Chris Bryant in with those kind of things and kind of mix and match them. So I'd lean Chris Bryant number one. Um, number two for me, uh, I think – do you want to split it? Hitter to pitcher or just mix it? Uh, you can mix it up if you want mix to. It. Yeah. Number two, I'm going to say I would love to bring in a veteran uh, starting pitcher. I, I okay. know it kind of sounds crazy, um, 
I get you have obviously Zach Wheeler coming off a, a Cy Young caliber year. You're going to, you, here's my problem though. Aaron Nola is a question mark. Let's face it. Exactly. We all want Nola to succeed. We all think he can succeed. But in reality, off, based off of last year, he's a question mark. Um, so he's obviously number two. Number three, you obviously have a, another question mark in, in a Zach Eflin um, on this team. And that's the thing. To me, you really only have one true starter right now that you know what you're going to get uh, game in, game out. Uh, obviously, listen, I I know people are probably going crazy because of Ranger Swords, but let's be honest. He had a phenomenal year last year, but we really don't know was it a fluke or not. We still don't yeah, know. You gotta wait to see in your second, yeah. third season of your career what you do. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And here's my thing too: is if you sign a veteran and you can move Swords back to the bullpen, is that more beneficial? Do you think you get that lefty, solidified lefty that can be a a closer when your closer needs a day off? Maybe you have him save a lot of games. That that's the thing. He adds a lot of versatility to your team. So maybe I, maybe I drop the starting pitcher back to third. But listen, I'm not talking. I know we're not getting Max Scherzer. I know we're not getting Clayton Kershaw. I'm not talking about that. But I think realistic options would be. I think you could be a, a late surprise on a guy like a Dan, Danny Duffy. Uh, a late surprise on a guy like um, a Marcus Stroman. Even maybe a late market push off uh, Kevin Gosman if you wanted to. I think he's probably a little pricey there for us uh, in terms of other spots. But guys like guys like a uh, Robbie Ray, John. John Gray, um, maybe Zach Davis. I don't know. That's kind of borderline. He's kind of up and down, but he's only 28, so maybe you kind of figure things out. So I think you can – That that's kind of all my wish list is kind of like a third. I, I want to move that down to three. I'm going to say number one, Chris Bryant. Number two, I want to solidify that leadoff spot. So I think, as we already talked about, that's probably going to have to come via trade at some point. Um, and then number three – uh, see, now I'm kind of backfiring. <laughs> I think we'll move starting pitcher back to four, I guess, because uh, I, as I talked this out, I would say that reliever is bigger than the starter. So you do need a solidified closer um, on this team. Paxton? Uh, I know he has. Yeah, I'd take a Paxton. But uh, he has I, the pot, one of the higher upsides of the guys remaining. I, I'd take a Paxton on this team, I think. I But talking now, I think that leadoff, Chris Bryant, a leadoff hitter, uh, a true, true closer, not not a makeshift closer like a Ian Kennedy again, um, which I, I'd bring him back as a setup man. I don't really want him in the closer. I don't want him as my closer either. <laughs> but and then that starter four spot, I think would be my top four things. So it, we'll we'll see what we do. But I don't know about you or if you agree with that or disagree with some of those positionings. But I would definitely say those are my top four: uh, Chris Bryant, then a, a true leadoff hitter then a true closer, and then a veteran starting pitcher to fill that back end of the rotation. Yeah, I mean, I think an underrated guy for me, I agree with what you said um, when it came to what we need, but when it comes to relief pitching, a guy that I mentioned last year when he got signed by the Padres was an underrated guy with a career two-something here. It's loading now, 279 career, relief ERA, 13.9 war, is Mark Melanson. Now, do you want him to be your closer? Maybe that's a little bit more debatable. He's done it a couple different times in his career, but when he has... He's had pretty good success as well as last season, so it doesn't look like he's aging poorly at all. He had 39 saves for the Padres, and then he had 51 saves in 2015 for the Pirates. So I feel like if the Phillies are in this still limbo period of how much money do we want to spend, he's the perfect guy to get because he's affordable, and he's a guy that's a swing guy that's a great eighth inning guy whenever he's done that in his career, and also whenever asked upon, has been one of the rare guys that actually does step up to the plate in full force as a closer, even though he hasn't been a career closer. Whenever you ask him to do it, more times than not, like in 33 save season, 47, 51, 30 save seasons he's had over his career, and then the 39 last year, he's stepped up to the table. So if you want to sign a guy that, a veteran that's been steady his entire career, and it doesn't seem like, hopefully it doesn't happen here, but anything's ever caught up to him yet, that's kind of one of the under the radar guys that I see on the market to go with Michael Givens. If you sign Michael Givens, who's more of a guy that's a bigger name guy that has a little bit flashier stuff, but actually hasn't been as consistent in his career as Mark Melanson has been in his entire longer major league career to have a two something ERA to Givens three something ERA in his entire career, which is still good. 
I will take him any day of the week. But Melanson doesn't have the control issues of which Michael Gibbons sometimes does get held back by. So I would like to have both of those guys to add two proven righties instead of just adding these southpaws that might hit it like the Scott Morses of the world, whether it's a rotation piece or not. The Emanuels of the world, who I think has the best chance because he has control to make the team right away. Or Ryan Sheriff, who, of course, has had some good moments in the majors already and has been good in the minors. You're getting a guy you know his control is good, he's just being consistent. I'm in his career, and you don't make the All-Star game four times for something. So uh, he's a guy that I feel would be decent. When it comes to starters, though, especially because I feel like of being a price range, you name the guy that I've liked his entire career when it comes to a left. Because when he's healthy, it's the same as Paxton, except for he's a tier below James Paxton. Paxton has the potential to be pitched like your ace for periods of time. Well, we've seen Duffy do that at times in his career, but he more pitches like a 2-3 when he's really on his game and then pitches like a really good four. So he's a guy I've always liked in his career because you just know if he can stay on the field, he's going to give you a good five to six innings that keeps you in the game like eight out of ten times at the very least and is a very good pitcher to have in your three through five. So that guy I've always liked his entire career, so I would definitely agree with that. A guy that you could, I guess, being he's 29, was very good two years ago off last year. He's probably going to only be like $2 million bucks at most if he keeps lingering on the market, one of those trial contracts, maybe four. Is Do you want to try Bundy as your fifth starter? That's a bigger question mark. He was good yeah. years ago, bad last year. Um, that's something you could do there. And then a guy that people, just because of his movement and his sinker ability, always you hear talking around the baseball sphere, will he ever catch one again with another team? Do you want to try former brave Julio Tehran as a fifth starter and see if he can kind of get it going? That's more of a depth move, like I talked about yeah. with Hamilton. Like, will they even make the roster in preseason? But He's been keep getting chances because people love the way his sinking fastball moves. And when he's able to actually click it in in the minors or when he was in the majors, he gets a good ground ball rate and he gets good productive outs, not in the air. But it hasn't been that way for a hot minute. But maybe you could get him back to that because if they're not going to spend a lot of money. Another guy that's honestly a interesting guy is Carlos Martinez, who, of course, that's flat. he's been yeah. in the pen and he's been a starter. What would you use him at? But um. He's a guy that never has fully hit the peak that people thought he would once hit with the Cardinals. Maybe he's one of those guys that will be like Gosman, go somewhere else, and then kind of have a good year and then really emerge the next year, and that would be nice to have. So he's an interesting commodity to watch. If he can do what Gosman did with the Giants here with the Phillies, that would be a nice thing to see that progression go to like a three, whatever it was, with Gosman two years ago, and then move all the way up to being top six in the Cy Young in the following uh, season. So that's something I don't think Carlos Martinez would do that. But if he can improve to like a three ERA or like a three, four ERA, that would be a very nice guy to have to add to your pitching staff, whether that's out of the bullpen or whether that's uh, as a swing man back and forth or actually in the steady rotation. So that was just an interesting guy. But those are out of the guys you said, you pretty much covered all the um, starters because. I've always liked him his entire career. I'm somebody that goes through anxiety just like him, so I've always appreciated the guy. But I don't think Greinke fits in with Philadelphia. So I don't want Zach Greinke for that. For that particular reason, I don't think he would fit in with – if we sign him, I'm not going to bitch and complain about it because I've always liked Zach Greinke. I just said that. But I don't know how his personality will mesh with the Philly media. That's the only thing. You might have a Brisgawa for like a Jake Arrieta combination situation there. So like that's, right. more, that's more why I'm not sure if he's the biggest guy that I would want. And with if he's more like Briz, it would be hilarious. And then if he's pitching well, I wouldn't care if he's joking about random crap that has nothing to do with baseball. But if he's not pitching well, then that changes everything. If, if, if Zach Greinke comes here and pitches great again, he could talk about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune all being his best friends that he talks to with having coffee and tea at night. And I could care less. But, but if he's not <laughs> pitching like Jake, I think he's going to fall into some of the same uh, issues with our media. Another guy, though, that hothead is maybe a light way to describe this individual, but, but, but um, has been good out of the bullpen his entire career with an electric fastball. One or two year deal to a uh, former Red Sox, former Dodger Joe Kelly. Maybe you can do that there. He's a guy that he's at least going to add energy. 
at least going to add energy to your team. Let's put let's put it let's put it that way. No one's ever going to be dead as a doornail in the bullpen that has Joe Kelly um, in it, or a guy coming off of an off year. Do you try to kind of reestablish? He was still all right at times, but not the same Adam Adovino, who wasn't the same last year, but kind of more like that Melanson category has been very steady Eddie his entire career and then had his first really just not like blah season that was in retrospect, not terrible, but compared to his career numbers was not good. So, yeah, those would kind of be the guys that I lay out as potential guys because you laid out the rest um, very well when it came to that where I think this about unless if you had other stuff closing stuff you wanted to touch on this about wraps us up is that was perfect because we're exactly on the hour mark pretty much so that worked out well sometimes timing just works out well in life you know not not enough though right <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> I, I'd say my final point would just be listen it's it's been frustrating hopefully these next few hours Let's go above these free. Let's hope the MLB is able to get a deal done because we could, everything we're talking about right now could mean nothing here in a few few hours, a few days if we're going to be locked out for most of the season. So hopefully the players committee, the union committee, the MLB front office and all them can get get together, lock themselves in a room here in the next few days, get a deal done, avoid a lockout, uh, at least a long-term lockout, and hopefully we can still play under 62 games next year because – uh this the sport needs it obviously for my own interest i want to watch it but from the covid missed games only playing 60 games that year this sport really can't afford to miss a good amount of games so that's my last point is hopefully these guys can get in a room get the get the deal done get the job done and uh, hopefully we can be on here in the next few days talking about a very solid uh deal that was completed and maybe some new positive rule changes to help the sport overall and then conclude that with some signings with the Phillies. So um, hopefully look forward to talking to you with some good news here in the next few days. Yeah. And then hopefully even so we'll still have some good stuff to talk about. If we do go into the, what seems like an impending shutdown with guys signing like Scherzer, if Castellanos does sign here since he's supposed to sign before the impending shutdown, uh, we'll still have stuff to talk about, but then it'll be with uh, mixed emotions because we're talking about it, happy about what's happening. But then when is the season going to actually play to see those guys featured um but that's about wraps us up today we thank you all for joining if you enjoy the content please subscribe at the easy to use widget up above at the end screen or on the always easy to use subscribe button down below we appreciate you for joining us for this edition of the sports fanatic news philadelphia phillies offseason show let's get to signing the big boys some nice small moves that might turn into something we need the bigger moves let's go dave let's go john let's get it going peace out everybody and stay safe